Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And welcome to the next installment of the 2021 Virtual Book Talk series, sponsored by the program in the history of the book in American culture here at the American Antiquarian Society. Today's guest is Elizabeth Kimball, uh, who will be presenting on her book, Translingual Inheritance, Language Diversity in Early National Philadelphia, published by the University of Pittsburgh Press earlier this year. Uh, we come to you today from the ancestral lands of the Nipmuc tribal community, a community that continues to thrive here in central Massachusetts. I'm Kevin Wisniewski, Director of Book History at AAS, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. As always with me is AAS Library Assistant Amanda Kondak. Thank you for being here, Amanda. Uh, before we introduce today's guest, uh, I do want to briefly introduce the Society for Newcomers. Uh, AAS was founded in 1812 by printer Isaiah Thomas. We are a research library and learned society located in Worcester, Massachusetts. We're devoted to understanding and sharing the history and culture of North America before the 20th century. As a library, we collect, preserve, and share the printed record of what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. Our collections include books and pamphlets, newspapers and periodicals, manuscripts, and the graphic arts. In addition to this virtual book talk series, we have a variety of public programs. We offer visiting research fellowships, and we welcome scholars and readers from around the world to use our reading room to work on their own research projects. And before I introduce today's guest, Amanda will very quickly uh, offer a little overview of the platform we're using today. Thank you, Kevin, and welcome everyone. Before we get started, I do have a few notes on the mechanics of our Zoom webinar format. The chat function is open, so please send your comments to all attendees and panelists throughout the presentation. I will also be posting information and links in the chat relating to our speaker, AAS and Quebec. And you should be able to save the chat by clicking on the three dots in the chat window. If you have any problems with your visual or audio settings, you can also message me privately in the chat. For the Q&A portion of the program, we'll be using the Q&A function located on the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have any questions for Elizabeth during or after her presentation, please type them in there. As attendees, you will also have the option to upvote your favorite questions by selecting the thumbs up icon, and we will answer these at the end of the program. And finally, I would like to let everyone know that we are recording the, the program and we'll be posting it on our website and our YouTube channel. So thank you everyone, and Kevin, back to you. Great, thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, now I'd like to introduce today's guest. Uh, Elizabeth Kimball is Assistant Professor of English at Drexel University. She is the author of Translingual Inheritance, uh, which she's presenting on today, and co-author with Eleanor Long and Jennifer Clifton of The Potentiality of Difference, Singular Rhythms of a Translational Humanities in Community Contexts from Intermezzo 2021. Uh, she is the co-chair of the Philadelphia Writing Program Administrators. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Elizabeth Kimball. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm so pleased to be speaking with the AAS today. And uh, I wanna thank Kevin, especially for spotting my book announcement and inviting me here. And um, thank you to Amanda um, for help with slides, especially, and everyone at AAS who made this possible and the program in the history of the book in American culture. So I've been thinking about the best way into this talk today and the diverse audiences who are likely here, who I can't see, <laughs> uh, who are here to learn about this book. And so I thought a little explanation of my own background and academic field might help. Uh, as an undergraduate student, I was in a very traditional uh, period focused English major and uh, just loved everything about that kind of textual study and the historicizing of uh, of, of literary culture and, um, and, and all of the context that came with it. And uh, whatever period I was studying, it, it just, it, it, I had the sense of just, you know, these kind of um, treasure trove of secrets that so many people had no idea were, you know, right there. 
uh, on a library shelf, right? Um, I, I know many of us share that, um, share that love. Um, but I always had a struggle at the same time that uh, sticking to textual study in English felt like something was missing. And so while I was majoring in English, I was doing a lot of other things on the side, um, studying Japanese and spending time in Japan, um, and uh, then realizing Japanese language was a like Japanese language study was a lifelong proposition, uh, which I did not want to spend in Japan. So uh, then I thought, let's learn some Spanish. And I went to Guatemala and went to a Spanish school. So I was constantly interested in, in sort of language acquisition and the experience of what happens to oneself when living in a language other than the one that you had learned as a child and had grown up in. Um, the struggle and the and the difference that happened in those experiences motivated me, um, I think, to get to where I eventually got uh, as a graduate student in the field of rhetoric and composition. Um, I returned to graduate, I finished undergrad, uh, did a lot of community work in, in Philadelphia and social service, and then uh, went to graduate school and there discovered the field of rhetoric and composition, which um, started to kind of gel why I wanted to stay in something that was Englishy, but um, a, a little bit different from the more a traditional approach that I had, had known as an undergraduate. So a core concept that motivated the field of composition from its origins in, let's say, the 1970s uh, is, is this notion of students' right to their own language. So the way that language and literacy had been taught historically uh, had in fact been a means of perpetuating social inequality, um, even though any of us who are language and literacy teachers uh, certainly um, hope that our teaching has the opposite, that it's a liberatory experience for students. Um, Sociocultural approaches to literacy have shown that literacy is not an abstract cognitive skill, um, but rather a nexus of practices developed in and across social networks, so that lamenting any kind of decline in literacy uh, is a fallacy. Um, uh, perceived decline is, is in fact perceived difference. Um, it's the work of language and literacy scholars to instead demystify language and linguistic difference. Uh, so in other words, the struggle that I felt when I was trying to learn uh, Japanese or, you know, or get along in Spanish and, and make some sense to people and, and connect and have human relationships with people and uh, the, the, how incredibly difficult that was as someone who had been grown up in a monolingual English culture. Um, those struggles were in fact experienced by all kinds of students in the same English courses where I had found such a niche that felt like uh, such an easy fit for me. So I knew there's some, there had to be some way to bring these perspectives to bear in a research study uh, that would tie together that which is afforded by textual study, uh, um, the, you know, the kind of typical practice that one might find in an English department uh, with the sociocultural perspectives of literacy studies. So with the lives of real people across a range of places and with a range of forms of power. So um, I began this project when I looked at a lot of excellent scholarship that was theorizing all these incredible acts of pedagogy uh, in rhetoric and literacy by people across a, a range of locations and demographics. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so Thomas P. Miller uh, was an early um, scholar who I discovered whose work I just loved, who um, did a lot to kind of open up how did the English department come to be. Um, he wrote about the rise of college English in, the, in what he called the British cultural provinces and then in a follow-up book uh, in the United States. Uh, Jacqueline Jones Royster um, did some incredible research that was very formative to me and uh, many people in rhetoric and composition uh, on the perspectives of Black women's literacies and how essential they have been um, to that corner of experience. Uh, other scholars, uh, my, my colleagues David Gold, Jessica Enoch, uh, were, just wrote incredible books that I really admired about um, teachers in all in a range of schools and a range of places um, outside all of the kind of traditional centers of, of disciplinary power or of academic power um, that have 
traditionally, you know, get written about when you write about the history of, of um, oh, whatever critical perspective or whatever it might be. So um, they were writing about women on the U.S.-Mexico border and about uh, teachers working in historically black colleges and universities and women's colleges um, in the normal schools where teachers were trained. Um, so these books were all offering me historical perspective on diverse literacies and language classrooms, um, the perspectives I was looking for, something that I wanted to emulate. Um, also, uh, in the first decade of the 2000s, particularly, but it's, it, of course, it happened before then and has continued since, but um, in this decade when um, I was sort of first coming to terms with, with what was happening here, um, rhetoric and composition was coming to even greater awareness of the experiences of students, uh, especially in college level writing classes, but in general, uh, students who are classified as non-native speakers of English and the problems of native language ideology and just how much our pedagogies um, are um, blindly uh, defaulting to a native language proficiency and assuming that that proficiency is uh, the only and the most desirable kind of proficiency and that anyone who's non-native ought to try to emulate that. So next slide. Um, so these scholars, uh, people like Paul K. Matsuda, uh, helped tremendously those of us rooted in writing programs, um, which have been housed in traditional English departments, to see that multilingual students had always been present in higher education in the U.S. Uh, and then uh, the work of Suresh Kanagaraja, who's been hugely influential and whose work really shapes a lot of my theorizing in this book, um, his early book, Resisting Linguistic Imperialism, shows how English lives all over the English lives all over the world and the ways that students and scholars make English their own outside the Western structures of assessment and reward. So my project in, in the broadest kind of possible sense, this is the context I was coming from, um, putting these two important collections of work in conversation with one another. The, the work on the history of, of rhetorical pedagogy, which you know, sort of fits into literacy and, and literary studies and language more broadly. And then the work on uh, language difference in education. Both of them really share that lens of, of kind of schooling being a lens through which we can see a whole lot more about the culture. And my book really does that too. Um, I wanted the work on language difference to inform the rhetorical pedagogy work and vice versa. So that was my own kind of scholarly exigence. Um, as the project has grown, I have been able to frame it more broadly um, in the way that it kind of speaks to our present moment. Um, certainly the impasse that we all recognize, uh, to, I will say that um, somewhat euphemistically, uh, that we seem to be at around public discourse and democratic deliberation um, in 2020, 2021, you know, in, in our times. Um, uh, democracy seems to be in trouble. And from day one in this country to the present moment, a key sticking point in democratic deliberation seems to be the question of difference itself. How can we have a country of equality when people are truly so very different? Um, this is where the, the old uh, chestnut comes in. Uh, it seems as though people literally are speaking different languages and sure enough, they are speaking different languages. Um, sometimes I like to say that language itself, it's, it's a lot like uh, what Homer Simpson likes to say about beer. It's the cause of and the solution to all of life's problems. So um, uh, classic rhetoricians joke. Um, but it seems to me that thinking about language diversity itself might do something different than other histories, which might look at particular conflicts and controversies either, of course, as they are emerge in language, because everything emerges in language, um, or, or histories that look at the history of language politics, of kind of overt disputes around what language uh, comes out in public, um, especially the politics of English-only ideology, which, of, of course, is the, you know, often cited as the sort of conservative driving force around language politics in the U.S., I take a different approach by examining the history of language diversity in early national Philadelphia at the time of the nation's founding and the decades following. And I have a couple of premises on which my research rests. So the first premise is probably familiar 
to many of you in the audience. Um, the first premise is that the US was always a place of many languages um, and we have to do better to understand what that meant. Um, of course, you know, it's, it's commonplace that people spoke all, all sorts of different languages and do today, uh, but it's the latter part of that sentence that matters. Um, wh what exactly do we mean when we say that? Uh, so next slide. Uh, I ran across this article by John Trimber uh, early on, and it really uh, provided a framing that I was looking for. Uh, he writes that representing the politics of language as the question of English amounts to a performance of the past that can be read symptomatically as a ritualized forgetting that the U United States was then, as it is now, a multilingual society. To frame the politics of language in terms of Anglophiles and Anglophobes maintains a resolutely English-only perspective that pays no attention or attention only in passing to the multiplicity of languages in North America and their relation to English in the colonies and the new nation. What I'm getting at here is that we need to decenter, but not dismiss the Anglo-American linguistic dyad as the central focus of a politics of language in the US post-colony to relocate it instead in the wider circulation of peoples and languages in the geo-historical reason of the circumatlantic world. So, you know, he's saying, yes, English language and the power that comes with it is definitely a big deal, a really important deal. Um, and we have to understand how the ideology of that English um, as a language has shaped us. And when I say ideology, I mean things like, um, you know, language ideologies are, are, are broad and can mean a lot of things, but not so much the language itself as the attitude about the language. So, uh, when candidate Barack Obama said, well, I'm in favor of greater immigration, but of course immigrants have to learn English. That's a form of language ideology, right? Like the assumption that English is, um, is necessary, is inevitable, is the only real choice there is. Those are, you know, that's one example of, of language ideology. Um, so there are a lot of histories of language in the U.S. that focus on these politics of English. Um, Dennis Barron is one um, that traces English-only ideology. And the story typically goes that some of the founders wanted to make English the official language of the country, and others said no. And the resulting uh, laissez-faire policy uh, to just let language choices be um, is, was a good thing. That's generally the assessment. It was a good thing to leave it alone. It encouraged diversity. At the same time, we can trace many attempts, both in Congress and in any number of local places, uh, that attempt to do exactly that, to make English English only. Um, the problem with these kinds of histories is that while they are busy weighing in on one political issue, they leave the actual practice of language diversity untheorized. Uh, it's a little bit like talking about race, which obviously people have done since day one, uh, without really understanding what race is or where it, come, it came from, or um, even the idea that that race really doesn't exist at all, right? Um, so Trimber says that we need to decenter but not dismiss the significance of English. So what would that history look like after it's decentered? That's really what I was attempting to do uh, when this project came together. Um, and here's just a quick visual representation. So next slide. Um, here's the, you know, the sort of classical origin picture, right? 1776, Philadelphia, founding fathers, this is what you think, this is the, the stereotype. And of course, this image and all that this image represents is incredibly important. Um, but if we decenter, de but not dismiss these men in this space and this language that they were speaking, what does the beginning of the country look like? Um, how does it sound? How do people understand their role in this new democratic space? What kinds of things do people think about their own language? So my project is to figure out how language mattered in early national Philadelphia, uh, roughly 1750 to 1830. Um, the place and the time where the country was really kind of getting started is symbolic of who we are as a country as a whole. And so if we understand better how people were thinking about language, we can start to shake loose the assumptions about how difference worked. Um, and doing that means that we can recognize generative possibilities for democracy as it really can be and not as we imagine it in compromised terms. So next slide. 
So um, this is the um, image of something like, you know, what we begin to think about. Um, I look at three communities in Philadelphia in this time period, uh, the Germans who were very numerous. Um, I always say that the, the city of Philadelphia was German speaking the way that Los Angeles is Spanish speaking now, right? It's just, it's kind of saturated into all sorts of places. Um, and that is really, truly um, forgotten about. Few people realize that. Um, the Quakers uh, are my second group, dominant religious affiliation, of course, the founders of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, and then finally, the free black community who made up the last one third of our kind of three major communities of Philadelphia. So, um, uh, I picked these three groups because they were actually mentioned by Ben Franklin in his initial um, kind of census research uh, on the city and said, Benjamin Franklin himself said, you know what, we're, we're Philly kind of broadly divided into thirds is, is made up of each of these groups. So um, I show how all of these communities were working to figure out for themselves what it would mean to be in a democracy. And as I contend, the best way to do that is by looking at how people understood language. Um, so if the country was always multilingual, as Trimber says, then how was it multilingual? Uh, next slide. And before I go on and say more about that, let me acknowledge that there is um, a lot of great work happening across a range of fields that is um, coming to terms with the diversity of the early Americas and several books that take on language diversity, particularly um, that are all really exciting. And it's great to see, you know, in our collective moment, how much this is happening across a range of disciplines. And I, I hope we can all, um, you know, find all the time and resources that we have to talk to each other, uh, which is always difficult. Um, but here, here are three books that kind of align with my Philadelphia context um, that I just want to call out as being really admirable and, and I would commend uh, readers to. Um, Patrick Urban does some wonderful thinking on translation and the cultures of pietism, which are adjacent to the Lutherans, which I examine in my chapter. Uh, Rodrigo Lazo just came out with a book that shows the flows of language and culture through Philadelphia uh, in Spanish, which is amazing. Um, I like his point that it need not be people who lived here. You know, I was focusing on the people with addresses, but his point is there's these flows that are just fascinating as well. Um, and then going further back, uh, a book that I found early on uh, in my own archival work was Milka Martha Moore's Commonplace Book, by um, which Karen Wolf uh, and Blecky had um, had kind of dug up and theorized and framed to really interesting effect. Um, and uh, of course, she's gone on and done lots of terrific work in history as well. So. Um, uh there's certainly a shared sense of a lot of really um a, a really vibrant and diverse philadelphia community um that a lot of scholars are recognizing and uh it's it's been a lot of fun to be part of that project okay so next slide so this is the second premise of my book which is that there is no such thing as english um in fact there's no such thing as any language um, the translingual approach posits that um, named languages are simply political entities, not objectively real within our own human cognition. Um, uh, next slide. So the typical way that we think about being bilingual, say, is like, you know, I'm speaking English and then when I cross the border into Mexico, I'm gonna like flip a switch in my brain and I'm gonna switch into Spanish, right? So like just the way we think about languages being aligned to geographic space, which of course is anyone could say doesn't really hold water. Um, we think of this as sort of cognitive space as well. Like, okay, now my brain is in my English box and then it's gonna switch over into my Spanish box. Um, in fact, cognitively, you know, we've all got one brain. And if we switch, it's because we're switching for the sake of uh, our contexts and the ideologies of people and the needs of the people who are listening to us. Um, so here's a, a significant quote from a uh, couple of 
sociolinguists who I really admire. Uh, translanguaging is the deployment of a speaker's full linguistic re repertoire without regard for watchful adherence to the socially and politically defined boundaries of names, named and usually national and state languages, um, by which they mean like, you know, France goes with French, right? It's uh, political entities are linguistic entities. Um, uh, just to give a, a little example of a, a student who I once had, I was teaching linguistics. Um, I was teaching up at Drew University, which is up in North Jersey, beautiful, you know, countryside campus. Uh, she said, when I'm home in Newark, she was from Newark, New Jersey, I speak Spanish and English blended together. And I'll say things like, don't got no time for all this studying. And she says, and then when I come to school, I, I only use English and I don't use any phrases like that like don't got no time, right? So we could look at her um, testimony and say she's so intelligent, she's so good at switching and choosing languages that are appropriate to her surroundings. She knows what each of her communities expects of her. Um, but we could also ask the other question and it's that other question I, I wanna try to get at. Why are we so compelled to name the differences between those two varieties? Whether we're doing it to say, you know, she really should only use standard English, which is the conservative um, answer or or the, you know, the more progressive answer, which is to say, isn't she so smart to be able to switch? Um, why are we compelled to even notice these at all? Um, we could say, uh, look at her tremendous linguistic capacity, but I want to get at something a little beyond that. The promise of the translingual approach is, is that rather than putting language categories first, uh, when we try to understand how people are using language, it's better and more accurate to ask, what is the full range of linguistic repertoire that's present here? So that's what sociolinguists do when they're working with living people, right? From a historical perspective, it means that we ask, what are the linguistic repertoires at hand in this text? And how are those repertoires deployed? So what does this history look like if we make a conscious effort to forget that English is not objectively real, but a category that we use when assessing contexts? It also means we look back to a place where the many language policies that shape our experience had not yet come to fruition. And that's what I really like about the 18th and early 19th centuries, because the country that we know was there, and yet so much of what has come to define our experience had not yet been invented. Um, 1840 was the advent of, um, you know, really truly like official public schooling in Pennsylvania. Before 1840, William Penn had written uh, public schooling into the charter for the colony. And so it had been a value that people embraced uh, all along, but because there was no, you know, they hadn't yet garnered the resources to have this kind of elaborate public school system. Um, communities were doing it on their own and they were making it up on their own and figuring it out and writing things about how they were gonna do it and thinking about the theory of it. Um, and when you think about the theory of education, you inevitably think about the theory of language. So that's kind of what I'm getting at there that I thought was just so fascinating. Um, uh, next slide. So this methodology that I've uh, kind of synthesized from these various places, uh, translingual historiography is rewriting history out of primary text with a new consciousness that linguistic capacity and agency have always exceeded the perceived named languages and exceeded the regulated and monolingualist demands of written genres. So we must read, translate, and interpret texts with a recognition that they represent only a small portion of the writer's capacity for meaning. So I just think this is so interesting from a you know, an archival research perspective for the same reasons all of us love archival research, right? It's just this tiny, tiny clue of this whole world. And what do we do with this tiny clue? Um, some of the, next slide. Some of the questions for identifying and analyzing primary documents, what do people write about their own languages? Uh, what do people write about language and education? Um, it varies depending on the context. Is it early literacy? Uh, in teaching uh, literature. Um, the Quakers, who I'll talk about in a minute, were always worried about novels. They just thought fiction was incredibly dangerous, right? Um, uh, or in teaching other languages. So, you know, when a school is offering um, uh, 
you know, where I grew up in Pennsylvania, every school taught, offered German and now I live in New Jersey and they offer Italian, right? Like what are those, what's the history of offering those, those languages, right? In terms of teaching them in schools. Um, and then also, this is so closely related, how are people expressing their religious faith uh, where language is the medium for the sacred? And then next slide. So the, finding these texts, identifying them then leads to rhetorical interpretation that ties in with the translingual approach. So how are genre, discourse, style, and voice manifesting? Uh, what are the material and ideological constraints that might be affecting this text? Uh, next slide. So Bakhtin, the um, Russian formalist theorist, uh, wrote that language is heteroglot from top to bottom. Um, so uh, how are these texts heteroglot? How can we situate them within the community's full linguistic repertoire? Uh, next slide. So um, I propose that Philadelphia is a more richly diverse place than we generally had realized. And we can discover that by examining language diversity in this expanded definition of language diversity. Um, the city of Philadelphia harbored a range of practices and concepts around language and identity, which are revealed once we adopt an understanding of translingual practice. These translingual practices constituted the city of Philadelphia. They were not simply supplemental to what the founders were doing over there in their standard English powerful rooms, right? Um, but fundamental to the place and time. And consequently, these practices retell a flexible, democratic and diverse US origin story. Um, so I show what people did to act on the notions of language that were unique to their communities in African-American, Quaker, and German communities, citizens built their own discourses about how their languages create identities and serve the common good. They use these discourses to articulate plans and pedagogies for schools, practice their faith, and articulate the promise of the young nation. Um, so let me show you a little bit now about uh, one key example um, from my chapter on the Germans, so next slide. Uh, so here is a snippet from the Union School of Germantown, which was founded in 1759. Um, Germantown today is a neighborhood a section of the city up on the northwest side of it. Um, in the 18th century, it was, it was a little bit of travel. It was up the hill, up the creek, uh, several miles. And it had been founded by Germans in 1683. And um, by this point in the 18th century, it was pretty prosperous. Um, there had been other schools in the area, uh, but in the 1750s, the community decided it was time for a real schoolhouse. And this is an excerpt from that plan. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so they wrote in this charter, the said schoolhouse should be a plain substantial building properly adapted and accommodated for two school rooms at least on the lower floor, together with every other convenience suitable and necessary um, and that the two rooms below stairs should be and continue for the use and purpose of an English and high Dutch or German school forever. So next slide. So I love this quote. I think it's so uh, representative of everything that I'm getting at. Um, it's in English, of course. Um, we say, of course. Uh, it's, the, it's the text that got preserved in the archive. Um, it's practical, it's material, it, you know, it's planned for a building. Um, sounds like the classic American schoolhouse, but it's not a one room schoolhouse. Uh, it's two rooms. And it sounds like it's proposing a bilingual school, right? It sounds like it's saying um, English, you know, kids file in the front hall and uh, English children turn left, German speaking children turn right, right? Um, it seems like an effort to align features in their environment, which is a, a concept of translingual thinking um, in order to make communication possible. And most profoundly to enable communication and literacy to continue across generations. Um, that's what most histories of the school have just assumed that they meant. Um, in fact, I would say, what would happen if we were to read this more translingually? 
Um, that is a, you know, that sort of, you know, this spatial organization, English here, German there, um, that itself is this monolingualist or even subtractive approach to language as it's sometimes called. What if we, you know, opened up our imaginations to other sorts of possibilities because it doesn't necessarily say that it had to be two separate rooms. Um, we don't know how the children are related to one another. We don't know what sorts of shared language they created. We don't know who their parents were, who they had married. Um, we have no idea about the story of integration versus segregation. Most people might say that Germantown was the original immigrant community that went through the same process of every immigrant community. You know, the, the children of the first generation learn English by the time you get to the third generation. Grandchildren, um, everyone's forgotten. The original ethnicity is, you know, a couple of uh, holiday recipes and, you know, uh, maybe a joke or two, but, but you know, the language is gone. Um, but German was in fact remarkably resilient over time in the US. German language schools were founded all over the Northeast and across the Midwest. Um, Germans kept arriving from Germany, well, it wasn't even Germany at the time, but when it became Germany, kept arriving um, for many, many decades yet. Um, and uh, Germans also continued to worship in German for a really long time. In fact, there's still a church, um, one of the churches that I write about that still exists in, in Philadelphia today, and they still offer uh, a service one Sunday a month in German. So we can either interpret this document as evidence that an additive model of bilingual citizenship was present in the early Republic, or is an imaginative touchstone that a more fluid translingual possi possibility of culture was present in the early Republic. It, it depends on our attitudes, which one we choose. I like to choose the latter one. I think it's more promising, more full of imagination. Um, either way, we're challenging the monolingualist assumption that English was the logical and inevitable reality for our nation. Okay, so that's a quick example. Um, the next slide. Uh, this is Haverford School, and um, this one's a little more complicated. This gets at uh, my chapter from about the Quakers. Uh, this is around 1830. Um, the Quakers, of course, had founded Pennsylvania with William Penn. Um, they believed in simplicity. They rejected the idea of kind of an institutional church. You know, they didn't need liturgy. They didn't need music. They didn't need stained glass. They didn't want anything coming between themselves and God. Um, by 1830, they were not as dominant a force as they had been. They had lost most of their political power, um, and in part because they had encouraged diversity. They didn't just try to, you know, keep um, keep generating their own Quaker culture. They they welcomed all sorts of different people, um, but they did still really care, of course, a, a great deal about. Uh, the Society of Friends and perpetuating what they saw as a, a very important um, contribution to the world. Uh, so there was a committee to form a school. And the next slide. So in 1830, there was a series of essays that appeared in the journal called The Friend, which was widely read by Quakers from all over. Um, and they were written under a pen name, uh, which was Asham. Uh, we don't know who it was exactly, but Asham historically was uh, the tutor to Elizabeth I, the Queen of England. So that was an interesting choice. Um, and these essays laid out all kinds of aspects of a school curriculum, buildings, who would attend, how free time would be structured. Uh, they wanted to create what they called a guarded education, meaning that students would live completely within the realm of Quaker practices, guarded from the influence of the outside world. And... Um, that general uh, concept we see in liberal arts colleges all over the country, right? Where they're always kind of in slightly remote places. Um, get away, get your moral education where there's not temptations of the city, right? Um, but uh, they also were advocating at the Haverford School for something that was not particularly Quakerly. Um, they were advocating for a classical education the idea of studying Latin and Greek uh, even then was going out of style. Um, Benjamin Franklin had been against it at, the, at what became the University of Pennsylvania. He said, you know, let's be practical here. Uh, let's learn in the, teach and learn in the vernacular. 
Um, but this community bore an intense relation with the questions of language in terms of its role and how we come to know things. And again, a very kind of metalinguistic theorizing. So here's one example. Next slide. Um, I am firmly convinced that the great importance of um, this knowledge of language is too little understood and appreciated. And just to skip ahead, much of the difficulty in which we experience, which we experience in our inquiries after truth, and indeed in our intercourse with one another, arises from the loose and inaccurate manner in which many people use words. There's a lot about this passage that's just simply characteristic of its time. Um, you could see the same ideas replicated in any number of texts. Um, the idea that if we just get more disciplined about using words, we could get over our disputes. That's a common idea. But uh, this motivating purpose of our inquiries after truth, um, such a motivating notion for Quakers. The pursuit is not about tapping into a universality that already exists, but rather about slowly and deliberately working towards the truth of what is right for the context at hand. Uh, and then we get to the rest of the passage, the next slide. Uh, from the philosophical construction and variety of ancient languages, they are by far the most proper for this purpose. So the study of language is the most expeditious method of acquiring a perfect knowledge of our own tongue. So we see the reasoning here, classical languages do play, can play a role in the Quakerly pursuit of truth because they encourage more nuanced or more perfect sense of meaning in English. So it's about that turning over, that wrestling with meaning. Now here's a comparison, uh, next slide. This is, I'll go through this quickly. I know I've been talking for a while here. Um, this next slide is from the Yale Report of 1828. This is a far more famous document in the history of education. It was written uh, by the faculty of Yale when there had been a lot of external pressure to modernize the curriculum. These were a traditional conservative faculty. They liked their Latin. They wanted to keep perpetuating that practice. Um, they say the study of the classics is useful because it furnishes taste. Um, it is the foundation of literature of modern times. Um, and especially it forms the effectual discipline of the mental faculties. Um, ex it helps one exercise talent. Uh, every faculty of the mind is employed not only in memory, judgment, and reasoning powers, but taste and fancy are occupied and improved. So there's all this 18th century faculty theory stuff here that's um, driving, you know, the reasoning that, you know, we kind of have these different, um, different forms of thinking that have to be cultivated. You know, everybody's worried about taste and things like that. Um, uh, but the, the point is, you know, more broadly is that what they're talking about is in improving one particular individual, right? It's about creating the best possible individual person who's really, really, you know, the really, really good at things, right? <laughs> like um, has the best skills, right? Like, you know, creating the, the, whatever Latin equivalent we can of, uh, you know, the next um, LeBron James, right? Like the top of the, <laughs> the best person in doing the thing. Um, whereas the Quaker slide is so much more about discovering truth, improving our discourses with one another. It's, um, it's not individualized and it's community oriented and it's community and it's oriented towards something bigger than all of us. Right. Um, this is what I think is so interesting. Um, a translingual reading can help us think about the, uh, the ways that what appears to be more or less the same, kind of these you know, generic kind of 19th century ideologies, we might say, um, they turn out to be different. And those differences themselves constitute the language diversity that is so important to understand if we are going to understand the place of difference in democratic formation. So. Um, Sussing out the translingual dispositions of writers in their context could reveal more about the variety of metalinguistic meta thinking and the formation of so many communities in the formation of the US. Um, yes, the Quakers were of course writing in English. Of course, they came out of the tradition, the English tradition in the sense of you know, England as, as geographic territory. Um, and, and they were also drawing all kinds of very powerful discourses. 
um, Haverford School was founded to be an elite place, right? Uh, it's what became Haverford College. Um, the point is that all of us possess capacity for far more linguistic flexibility than most of us get to exercise, especially in monolingualist cultures. And also that all of us possess far more complexity around um, metalinguistic ways of knowing um, and our relationships with language ideology that um, mapping them in you know, a sort of narrative of, of, of good and bad, um, progressive and conservative um, doesn't, doesn't work too well. There's so many um, far more kinds of complex nuances that get lifted out once you start digging into it and looking through this lens particularly. Um, in everyday practice, people translanguaged. They thought about language, they practiced it in an assembly of bodily experiences. Um, in this case, for Quakers, they were sitting and waiting for the light of God to appear in meeting for worship. Um, they recognized how their own communities could shape larger ideas to make them work for themselves. Um, these are just two examples, uh, brief ones that are somewhat easy to explain. Um, I look at the same with uh, the work of Richard Allen, who was the African-American preacher who eventually founded the um, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and, uh, you know, further explanations in the German and Quaker community as well. Um, and I know that it's only the beginning and that there's far more um, examples that we could find in Philadelphia and we could find really anywhere because it is part of the human condition. Um, it's equally important, I want to add, uh, to search for non-English texts. Um, I use the texts that were in English today, um, as I said, because they are great examples. Um, but this is also about cultivating our own capacity to um, identify and read and analyze things that are in languages other than English and recognizing that, that most of them have not been preserved in the archive um, because we've had this monolingualist culture. So I did have a lot of fun uh, translating a, a whole bunch of the German texts, um, but it took a lot of effort. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think that's a major sort of angle that we need to think about as we expand our scholarship. So next slide. Uh, so I'd like us all to think about how a translingual understanding might help us to see languaging that we might not otherwise see. Uh, when I look at Philadelphia in the beginning of our country, and I really start to look at what people were writing as they figured out what this country was going to be about, I see all the ways that we can shed so many of our expectations about what this country is, that expectations that really came later. Uh, we need to look well outside the places where democracy and public life is, are obviously happening and see democracy in all sorts of corners and, and locations. Uh, what if we saw the US not in English, not just in other languages, but in ways that transcend language categories? How would we find space to think without expectations around language standards? without anxieties about literacy levels, without standardized testing? How would we rewrite a history that says the colonies were settled by the English and anyone else who came learned English and it's inevitable that we all speak in English? Looking back to an origin story in which that English was not inevitable is part of the work we will need to do to reimagine a just future. So I hope I've opened this up in a way that invites further thinking and please ask me anything you like and thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Liz. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> um, as uh, as Liz kind of noted at the very end, there uh, we are open uh, for a Q and A. Um, if you go to the bottom of your screen uh, to that navigation, uh, you can submit your questions there. Uh, as we await for questions to arrive, I I'd like to kind of get the ball rolling a little bit, Liz. Um, with a few myself. Uh, first and foremost, there's a tradition here um, in our now over one year uh, <laughs> tradition of uh, these virtual book talks to, to dive a little deeper into uh, the process or the making of the book. Uh, and so I'd really love to hear a little bit about uh, the archives that you visited uh, in and around Philadelphia what your experience uh, was like uh, at these archives, because they are in some cases, uh, I think a little bit off the beaten path, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to the you know, larger uh, repositories you have in the city. 
uh, and any special finds, uh, you know, that immediately come to mind uh, at these places? Yeah, I had a ton of fun. Um, you know, this started out as my dissertation, and I had this idea that um, when I was mentioning uh, Thomas Miller's work, he, he was working in the what he called the British cultural provinces, and that there were all these unanswered questions about schooling in Scotland. And I really wanted to go to Scotland. Someone told me, oh, there's all these schools with like, you know, just dresser drawers where you can just pull open things and there's like 18th century text lying in there. Um, but uh, I was at graduate school at Temple in Philly and I and I didn't have the resources and I had a family here. And um, it's it, it it suddenly hit me that, oh, it's the same transatlantic world. What am I so worried about? And here I am. Um, so uh, I just started kind of looking around. Um, I got really interested in the Germans first off. Um, and there's a the oldest uh, benevolent society uh, for immigrants is the Pennsylvania German Society, which is, uh, in fact, I would drive by it every day on my way to campus. And um, they have this beautiful 19th century library. Uh, so I went there and started talking with the librarians. Um, their, their library, it, it truly was a library, not an archive. Um, so I didn't particularly use anything there, but I started looking at their collections of textbooks and, and primers and things like that. Um, then I found these Lutheran texts, uh, which are the, I used some texts from a, a Lutheran minister. I didn't get into that in the talk today, but um, they were in a Lutheran church publication that are held up at the Lutheran seminary, which is in Philadelphia. So I went and and talked with them and they have an archive there and I looked at some stuff. Um, the one, uh, I guess, more um, established archive I visited was, uh, thankfully I had a nice little fellowship that gave me a summer at the Quaker collection at Haverford College. So um, those, those archivists were wonderful and they really did turn me on to kind of the, the whole story of the founding of Haverford and things like that. Um, I also went out to uh, Westtown School, which was a, a is a Quaker boarding school that goes way back. Um, just had wonderful long conversations with the librarians there, who just knew all kinds of corners of history that I never would have, I couldn't have figured out even from reading. Um, and uh, where else did I go? There was one other I was going to mention. Um, not thinking of it now, but anyway. Uh, Mother Bethel AME Church also has a, a really cool collection that was um, ties in with my African Americans chapter. So, um, but it was really honestly conversations with archivists were just the best because um, they would always, of course, bring out the finding aids and show me how to use them and all sorts of things. But um, the thing about doing this kind of research is that it's not under a topic that has been a like a catalog topic or a keyword. So it was usually more, I'd say, well, I'm interested in schooling, and they would bring me minutes from like board meetings, which are a little dull at times, <laughs> um, you know, but some of the, like the guy at Germantown Academy had really fascinating insight on sort of how to read through the politics of those meetings. Um, and then often you would just, you know, it was in the course of talking with the archivists that they'd get a sense of what I was looking at and they'd go, well, what if you look at this and they'd bring me something and, and that was just the best. So I don't know how I could have possibly done it without all the librarians and archivists who, who sat down and were willing to talk to somebody who really had no clue where she was headed and, you know, just a grad student. <laughs> so it was great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, we have a, a bunch of questions that just arrived here. So I, I want okay. to get to as many as possible. You did mention uh, the finding aids. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and while we're kind of on that subject, there was a question added to the chat uh, a little while ago asking, uh, does the lack of multilingual finding aids impede the acknowledgement or use of archives, which uh, do contain evidence of multiple language texts. Yeah, yeah, sure. I guess I hadn't really thought about the distinction between the finding aid and the archive itself. But yeah, I mean, we have this whole history of monolingualism and, you know, it's just, of course, the medium we're all supposed to work in. Um, so yeah, certainly. I mean, it would be, you know, of course, at the same time, it's my own limitation as well. I mean, I'm also, you know, sort of monolingual American. So it would be fascinating to ask that question of, of like Rodrigo Lazo, who wrote about letters from Philadelphia and was looking at all these Spanish language texts about exactly how he did it. Um, it could be a pretty incredible project if it really snowballed. <laughs> 
Also, also related, uh, uh, somewhat related to uh, language. Uh, what about the inclusion of Native American concepts and language? Uh, do they even appear sparsely in the in, in your book? Uh, where do they appear? Um, and there's a note here. It's interesting uh, with the beginning of the webinar uh, that the acknowledgement of the native uh, native land acknowledgement uh, with the concept of language as political influence. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, they appear sparsely, and I and I um, I regret that. Um, the I, I do talk in the beginning about sort of where do we draw the boundaries of the history that we're looking at? Is it geographic, but also, you know, sort of um, like temporal? If you, if, you know, if, if you zoom out on the lens in space as well as time, um, you really quickly get to uh, indigenous languages and they're very much a presence. Um, you know, there's there's some like some really interesting history that was written about the Swedes who actually arrived even before the English a little bit further down the river, but, you know, same general area. Um, and that there was a, a particular Swede who did a really good job of kind of, and also a member of an Algonquin tribe who did a really good job of kind of talking to each other. Um, and uh, uh, what else? Oh, um, the uh, Philosophical Society in Philadelphia had a, a really great exhibit a couple of years ago about Thomas Jefferson and all that he had done to kind of record and um, uh, get the grammars of native languages down on paper. Um, of course, there's all sorts of issues around that, but um, there was certainly always tons of interest and tons of recognition that there was this vast linguistic diversity. Um, I did make the decision to sort of narrow the body chapters to the, the these three main communities because I, you know, I kind of wanted to take Benjamin Franklin's own uh, framework because it would give a way of saying, you know, actually, yeah, yeah, here's the diversity. Like you said, there was diversity back then and here it is. Here's what it looks like now. Um, but there's so much to be done around native languages and, and, and who was speaking them and when and, and what are our relations to them and how can we restore them? So. You do, uh, I think, uh, complicate the waters in the chapter on, on uh, German communities in particular, because you do kind of separate uh, uh, you know, the you know, larger German community uh, and break it down from, uh, I think, religion. So you have, you, you have right, church, you have uh, uh, the Moravians, the Lutherans, the Mennonites, each creating their own church or their own schools and curricula and the like. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of wanted to kind of mention that because uh, we do have a question regarding the Quakers um, asking uh, that uh, many of the Quakers who accepted Penn's invitation uh, to colonize were Welsh. Uh, so do you see any impact uh, within uh, the Quaker community uh, from the Welsh language, for example? Uh, this, the story around that, if you start looking into it, people have written that's a popular idea, but it's not clear that Welsh continued very well or very much beyond um, what's sometimes called emblematic language use. So like, you know, sort of putting it on display when it sounds nice to be Welsh. <laughs> you know? um, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's very visible in place names because they, you know, he gave them this tract of land that went out and what's now Philadelphia's main line. So there's all sorts of Welsh place names. And um, there was a, an event where members of St. David's Church in Radnor, which was an Episcopal church, uh, you know, sort of embraced its Welsh heritage, had some sort of like parade into Christ Church in Philadelphia. And uh, then there was a sermon given in, given in Welsh. Um, but it's another one that it's, it's, it's hard to suss out and know exactly what that looked like. And again, how much of that is our own sense of linguistic containers influencing you know or our notion of fluency influencing what people did and and then you know it, it's a truism to linguists and it's and it's not so obvious to everybody else but written language and spoken language are not the same thing like writing is not language speaking is language so what got set down on paper and then what people were actually doing when they talked to each other is um, that's part of the sort of clue of, of, you know, what I'm trying to look at kind of archaeologically. 
I think we have time for two more questions here. And I think that uh, where you ended that last response ties into to this question. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the formats in which people communicated about language uh, orally via manuscript or print? Uh, and do those differences seem to matter uh, to your various speakers or writers? Hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of a collection of sources that I came up with. I mean, what I, in the end, the sources where I do the heaviest analysis are all print sources. Um, you know, the, the Germans and the Quakers, they were both um, church publications, essentially, you know, the, the newsletter of, of whatever group. Um, churches are always good at sending out lots of print material. <laughs> um, uh, and then, of course, the Germantown School Charter, right? Um, and then the uh, chapter on African Americans, I mostly look at Richard Allen's um, autobiography, which is really kind of a multi genre anthology. Uh, it includes his own personal life narrative, but then it also includes prayers he wrote and it includes um, the um, the document that got written about their poor treatment and nursing people through the yellow fever epidemic, which is a famous document. Um, and then also uh, the another thing that I get into, the um, African supplement, which was a legal document that finally gave them the right to um, maintain their own church and own church property. So, um, so I ended up using all kind of print sources more than manuscript sources. Um, Someone once said to me, um, I can't believe you're a woman and you didn't write chapters about women. <laughs> um, and it was the women who had all the, you know, the really great manuscript sources. So I, I wanted to mention the Commonplace book um, because they had, you know, they weren't getting stuff in print. They were just circulating it and writing it and sharing it with each other. Um, so, yeah, maybe I need to go back and rewrite this all again with purely manuscript sources. <laughs> I would actually, that was actually going to be my question as well at the very beginning, um, because you mentioned women in this uh, introduction you have uh, breaking down the demographics um, of the city. Um, so I wanted more of that as well. Um, <laughs> I, have, I, I think we have time. There was a bit of tease in, in certain chapters, you know. Um, we have time for one more question here, and uh, this one comes from Nancy Eisenberg, and she uh, very straightly uh, says, uh, Benjamin Franklin hated the Germans. Uh, ah, and yeah. that, uh, they were disruptive because they spoke German uh, instead of English. National myths of unity seem to promote uh, a reliance on one language, which uh, is even why uh, conservatives today insist on English as the dominant language. Uh, the question is, doesn't nationalism subvert language diversity? Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> Um, Benjamin Franklin uh, said those things as a younger man, uh, and they were in the context of uh, trying to win election, and the Germans were siding with the Quakers, uh, and, and uh, they were also running really robust printing presses and, you know, print trade of their own. Um, so they were really, really literate, and he was getting ticked off, and uh, he said a, a bunch of nasty things. Um, uh, uh, the other thing that it gets even worse is um, he called them swarthy and there was a whole, you know, he, he, it's in the book, but there's a, you know, there's a, there are a whole overlay of race on this language difference as well. That's, that's truly troubling. Um, uh, he did change his mind later in life, but, you know, maybe that's because he could ease up because the, the English language had attained more power by that point. Um, the relationship between named language and nationalism, though, I don't, you know, I think subvert is is one of the verbs that we could use, but I would say that it's it's such a tricky issue because um, it's also the need to assert one's identity, and the the way in which power and identity can be. Um, uh, subordinated in one context and then you know and then the the non-subordinate in the next context can change 
really, really quickly, right? So like I, the fascinating thing with Spanish, you know, Spanish is the conqueror's language. It's the colonizer's language. Um, on the other, and, and you can see that all across Latin America. On the other hand, you can look at Spanish in the U.S. and suddenly it's the subordinate immigrant language, right? So if, if a person is sort of extolling their love of Spanish and its wonders as a language, where's the power and dynamic in that? You can't just say it's a power dynamic. You've got to think about the whole context. Um, with that, I think we're out of time. So I would like to thank uh, uh, Liz Kimball here for uh, her time and for her book. Um, I want to make sure I have this <laughs> up here. Uh, it is available online. So please check that out. Um, uh, please note as well that this talk will be published uh, on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. So you can be on the lookout for that. Uh, we do have a public program this evening. Uh, uh, on disability history with Laurie Block. Uh, that is at 7 p.m. And our next book talk is on September 30th. It features Gordon Frazier from the University of Man uh, Manchester, uh, who is speaking on his new book, Star Territory, Printing the Universe in 19th Century America. So please check all of those out. The links are in the chat. Um, it was a pleasure uh, as always. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, I will see you next time. Thank you so much, Kevin and everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Liz. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.